hi and welcome. Thank you for joining us for this webinar today. Uh, my name is Melissa Lefebvre and I work with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. Um, I work with the Education Department and I'm lucky enough to work with uh, some of our native plant demonstration gardens that we have here at the head office. So we will get going here. If you don't know about CWF, um, we're a national charity. We're one of the largest, lar largest uh, conservation organizations in Canada with 300,000 members. Um, and our mission is to you know, ensure a healthy habitat and um, wildlife for future generations. So we do this through various education programs. Um, we also uh, advocate responsible human actions, including you know, the best practices. Um, and we support wildlife research across Canada. So we're here today to talk about gardening for butterflies. And I think it's a topic that a lot of people are excited about lately. Um, so I'm excited to share with you what I know. And I'm sure you guys will know a few things too. So just you know, feel free to add into the comments and ask questions as we go. And I'll do my best to keep track. Great. All right. So uh, what we'll talk about today is why to garden for butterflies, although I'm sure I don't need to convince you. Um, we'll look at some of the features and benefits of a wildlife friendly garden in general, and then we'll look at the specific features of a butterfly garden that you might like to include. Um, and then I'll show you some of our really cool resources that we have that can help you get started. So why create a butterfly garden? Well, uh, the number one threat facing many pollinators, including butterflies, is uh, habitat loss. So by creating a butterfly garden, you're actually creating some really important habitat that might not otherwise exist. Um, it's also super fun and rewarding. Um, if any of you are garden already, you know that it's uh, so rewarding when you plant something and then all of a sudden, you know, it blooms and then you get little garden visitors. That's always fun to watch. Supporting pollinators is a big deal right now. Um, it's been in the media a lot lately. You've probably heard about declining monarchs and uh, declining bee populations. Um, they're having a hard time and they're super important because they give us all the wonderful foods that we love and they help support uh, the natural world that we depend on. And of course you'll be making a difference, so that's always great. So we'll talk about the features of a wildlife friendly garden in general and these of course apply to butterfly gardens. So first and foremost, you're going to want to meet the basic needs of wildlife. So we're talking about food, water, shelter, and space. Um, you're going to want to use earth-friendly gardening practices, and I'll get into that a little bit um, more next. And you're going to want to incorporate native plants too. So when we're talking about earth-friendly gardening or organic gardening, we're talking about avoiding synthetic pesticides and herbicides and this is a really big deal when it comes to butterfly gardening because these guys are especially susceptible to uh, the effects of these chemicals. Um, with pesticides it can affect the butterflies directly and with herbicides um, it can kill the plants that they need to help them survive so that's a big deal. Um, natural insect control or natural pest control is something that we also prefer to use over synthetic chemicals and we have a really great ha um oh the audio is gone somebody's having issues with the audio. If anybody else is, please let me know. Um, it seems to be working for me here, but... Okay, somebody else is responding. At the top of your screen, there should be a little green microphone, uh, or a little microphone, and if it's not green, just click it, and that will hopefully solve the problem. Oh, okay, great, thank you. A few people is, are saying it's working fine. Great, thanks guys. Okay, so I hope that um, Linda is able to solve her problem, but we'll just carry on for now. Uh, so yes, natural pest control. Uh, we have some really fantastic handouts actually. Um, so if you care to have one of those, I'll leave my email at the end of this presentation and you can contact me and you can get a whole bunch of great methods of uh, getting rid of pests in your garden naturally. Um, organic gardening and compost go hand in hand. Uh, when it comes to organic gardening, earth-friendly gardening, we talk about enriching the soil rather than just fertilizing the plants with something synthetic. So you build up your soil and that leaves you with some great plants. Um, you're going to want to use green lawn care. So a lot of people are super concerned with having kind of a perfect weed-free lawn, but um, 
you know, you can do this uh, in a few different ways. You can apply some chemicals, uh, which is not what we recommend, or you can kind of tolerate a few leaves uh, or weeds here and there. And one of the best methods, I think, to help fertilize your lawn is just to, when you're mowing your lawn, just um, just clip it when you, or leave the clippings in place rather, and uh, they will go back to fertilizing the um, soil. So that's an easy kind of a lazy little fun green lawn care tip. Um, conserving water is super important too when it comes to organic gardening. So I'm sure we all know about rain barrels and um, using mulch to help keep the ground moist. Um, and not only does mulch help to keep the moisture in, but it also helps keep the weeds away. And um, as time goes on, the mulch will break down and kind of fertilize the soil again. So it's a really great little cycle that you've got going on. So what are some of the benefits? We talked about enriching the soil. Beautiful, rich, healthy soil means beautiful plants, and you'll be the envy of all your neighbors. Um, helping wildlife helps us as well. Uh, think of what pollinators do for us, and um, you know they pollinate not only our food crops, but also uh, trees and plants that help filter our air. So these are things that we can't uh, necessarily do ourselves. We need some help there. Um, and native plants are beautiful. A lot of people, when talking about native plant gardening and wildlife-friendly gardening, uh, are so focused on the wildlife that they forget that uh, native plants can be absolutely gorgeous. Um, you'll be saving yourself water because you've got those rain barrels, time because you're not weeding constantly because you've got the mulch, and effort, and money as well. So as gardeners, I'm sure you can all appreciate that. And of course, the satisfaction and joy of watching all the little guys that come to our gardens. So now we'll get into the specific features of a butterfly garden. And the first one we'll talk about is food. And we'll look at this on two fronts. So we'll talk about food for butterflies and food for caterpillars as well. So when we're talking about the adult butterflies, you're going to want to make sure you have a great diversity of nectar and pollen rich plants. Uh, it's best if they are regionally native to your area or heirloom plants are great too because these kinds of plants have evolved um, with the landscape for hundreds of years. And, um, oh, I've got a question about, about mulch, sorry. I'm just going to have to find a balance between reading the questions and going through the presentation. I'll just address the, um, the mulch question right now. You can use a lot of things for mulch. Uh, one of the best things is just leaves. If you have you know, leaves hanging around from trees, you can kind of crush them up a bit and use that in your garden. Um, here we use wood chips, actually, uh, basically whatever we can get our hands on, whatever is free. Um, but I do recommend that you switch the mulch up every, you know, every so many years, just because when it does decompose, it can go into the soil and change the chemistry of the soil. So you just want to watch out for that. Um, how much mulch would I recommend or suggest? Um, depends on the kind of plant. So if you have really hardy perennials, you can get away with, you know, like a this much mulch kind of thing. Um, if they're really delicate woodland plants, you're going to want to use a, a finer layer. And um, for woodland plants too, you'd probably prefer to use some leaves or something like that. So, oh, well, somebody's having connection issues. That's okay. So hopefully that answers the mulch question. I, you can um, ask more questions kind of toward the end or, you know, as they're appropriate. Um, so yes, the, the butterflies, feeding the adult butterflies, we're talking about regionally native plants and heirloom plants because they've evolved for hundreds of years with the landscape and the local wildlife. So these are the ones that are going to best support the adult butterflies. And also the nectar is uh, more easily accessed on these kinds of plants. So when you have all these cool uh, different varieties that we see at the nursery with like double blooms and triple blooms, they can look really beautiful. Um, but the nectar isn't necessarily easily accessed by the butterflies. So if you do include those in the garden, make sure that you also have some native plants and some heirloom plants. Uh, another thing to consider is uh, having a succession of blooms. So you're going to want to have some plants that bloom early spring and then, you know, summer and then into the autumn, just to support all different species of butterflies uh, throughout the year. Oh, and also planting them in large groups can really help um, attract the butterflies initially. And this goes well with, you know, kind of garden design principles, technically, like, we typically um, would plant plants in groups of three to five anyways. So this actually works incredibly well um, to attract them. 
Here are a few examples of some really nectar-rich uh, blooms that you can plant. And I can't uh, be as specific as to say, you know, what you should plant in your area, but generally speaking, these kinds of flowers are found across Canada and you can find some that are native to your area. So lupins, I'm sure a lot of people already have in their gardens. Um, different types of false sunflowers are great too, and they bloom at different times of the year and um, in sunny conditions or shady conditions, so have a good variety there. Cone flowers are great, any kind of asters are great as well. I think we have a few more plants here. Goldenrod, not to be confused with ragweed. Um, goldenrod is so great for so many pollinators, but it also attracts really big, beautiful butterflies, so um, it's a really great one to include. Clovers, so again with the lawns, uh, the lawn care, you know, don't worry if you've got a few clovers coming into bloom, they kind of add some color to the lawn and they help out some of these little guys right here. And buttonbush is a really cool plant. Um, if it's native to your area, pretty sure it's native to most of Ontario. Um, I would recommend this, it's a really great shrub and it has these really cool kind of pom-pom white flowers that uh, butterflies love. And somebody's asking about lupins being invasive. Um, some lupins, I'm sure, can be invasive, but there are some native ones that you can include. Um, and in, sometimes the term invasive is confused uh, with just something that grows a lot. So an invasive species is something that isn't naturally found in an area. Um, and something that just is aggressive grower, it could be native to Canada, but uh, it's just a little bit aggressive. So She's right in one sense, um, lupins can be big spreaders and you may want to just watch that, but I find them easy to pull up and um, not an issue in that sense. And they add a lot of really gorgeous color to the garden too. Oh, and somebody's asking about butterfly bush. Yeah, that's a great option too. It's not uh, a native plant to my knowledge, but you can definitely include that in your garden. That's uh, a really good option for sure. Um, so for caterpillars, uh, this is a whole different kind of thing. Um, with butterflies, you're supporting the adult butterflies that are passing by, but when you're providing food for caterpillars, you can actually impact um, butterfly populations. You can have a really good impact on them. You can help them increase. So you're going to want to pick plants that are specific to the kind of butterflies in your area. So they're a little bit pickier than the adults. Um, and it's for usually species specific. For example, uh, milkweeds and monarchs. I'm sure most of you have heard that you know, monarch populations aren't doing fantastic right now, and the best way to help them out is to plant milkweed. Um, bee balm is a great one as well, somebody was asking. So bee balm is a fantastic choice, and it also helps out hummingbirds, so they're always fun to have in the garden too. So here are a few um, just general examples of caterpillar, cali my goodness, caterpillar food plants. Um, so a lot of plants in the carrot family, so, you know, Queen Anne's lace and dill, parsley, you can let some of your herbs come to flower um, from time to time, or sometimes you see a field full of Queen Anne's lace or even some invasive plants, but they can actually help out some caterpillars. Um, lots of plants in the aster family can help them out too, and vetch, so those are plants in the pea family. Uh, a lot of trees are really fantastic for caterpillars too, so willow, uh, plum and cherries, oak, maple and poplar trees. But we do have to understand that when we're um, planting for caterpillars, some damage is to be expected. So um, yes, it makes the biggest difference to plant for caterpillars, but you're going to experience a bit of damage in your garden and you can just, you know, tell your friends and neighbors that complain that you're just helping, um, you know, the caterpillars eat their way to butterflyhood. All right, so moving along. So here's just kind of like a three-step process that you can walk yourself through when you're talking about choosing the best host plants for you and your area. Um, a lot of questions, uh, when you signed up for the webinar, there was an option to ask a question, and there are a lot of questions about specific plants and specific butterflies in your area. But since we're a national organization talking to people across many provinces and regions, um, we can't get too specific, but I can give you this really great uh, three steps that you can use. So first of all, you're going to want to find out which butterflies are in your area. And I think the best way to do this is to contact a local naturalist group uh, near you, or if there's a university that you live near that has a great biology department, they would probably be able to tell you what you have in your area as well. 
Of course, there are many resources online or field guides can help too. Then the second step is to find out what those butterflies, what the, their caterpillar food requirement is. So that you can find in a field guide fairly easily. And then the third step is to match their food requirements with the native plant species in your area. So again, naturalist groups are going to be your best bet. Um, on our website, we have a really fantastic resource. It is a native plant encyclopedia, and I encourage you to check it out. It's, it's very comprehensive, and I'll um, talk about that a bit later on in the presentation. And so here are a few other features that you're going to want to include in your butterfly garden, so water. And if you're not lucky enough to have a really gorgeous pond like we have here at the head office, um, you can just take something as simple as a little shallow dish, fill it with some water, and then create some little perches with you know, some stones. And that can be a great spot for all kinds of little insects to get some water. If you've ever seen um, a bunch of butterflies kind of gathered at a mud puddle, or just kind of, it looks like they're resting on the soil, they're actually uh, sucking up nutrients from the soil. So just like you and I need nutrients from our food, they need nutrients as well, and um, many butterflies get this from the soil. So here are some swallowtail butterflies, and they typically do this behavior a lot. Um, you can just leave one area of your garden kind of mulch-free, and, um, oh, and somebody made a comment about uh, mosquitoes, and be careful about mosquitoes. So yes, if you have stagnating water, definitely watch out for that kind of a thing. Just, um, it's best to kind of clean these things regularly anyway, so every day or two just empty out the water and uh, refill it, kind of like if you had a bird bath or something too. Um, yeah, so it's super sim simple to create. You can just leave a little bare patch in your garden, make sure it's moist, or you can even put out a dish specifically if you wanted um, with some moist soil in there. Another great thing for um, if you're creating a butterfly garden, you're going to want to choose a fairly sunny site that's uh, well sheltered. So uh, to create a really great place for them to get some sun, you can just put out some nice stones in a sunny area in the garden, and they will hang out there and just uh, warm up because they don't like to fly if they're not warm enough. So that's one thing to consider. So shelter for those chilly, windy days. Um, all the different animals elements that you put in your garden, like um, rocks and logs and, uh, you know, just anything decorative can actually really help them to have some shelter as well. Um, and you're going to want to consider planting things of various heights. So, you know, you've got maybe like a back layer of trees down to some shrubs and then beyond that some taller perennials and then some shorter ground covers. Um, so this kind of provides maximal or maximum uh, shelter opportunities for these guys. And birds will enjoy that as well. And somebody is asking about including rocks and twigs in the bird bath. If you wanted to, you could put a couple of little rock perches. Um, and insects will use it as well as birds. But you probably wouldn't want it as full as uh, the picture that was just up here right now. So nesting sites are really important as well for these little guys. And a lot of butterflies tend to lay eggs in um, kind of tall grasses and bushes, piles of uh, leaves and sticks. So one thing to help this along is if you're not living next to a field, you can kind of create a little mini field in the corner of your yard and just let one little corner grow kind of wild with the grass and whatever else kind of hangs out there. Or you can create a brush pile by just stacking a bunch of twigs and leaves in one area. And this will give them some really great nesting sites and provide some shelter as well. Overwintering sites are important too. Um, often we th when we think about butterflies in winter, we're thinking about the monarch that does this fantastic migration. But the truth is that not all of our Canadian species are migrating, especially not such great distances like the monarch. So we do have to provide them with some overwintering sites. And um, something really cool about butterflies is that they can overwinter at any stage in their uh, life. So they can overwinter as an adult, as an egg, or as a caterpillar. Um, it depends on the species, of course. So what we advise is to leave your garden clean up until spring, because some of the adult butterflies might like to kind of hibernate underneath um, some of the mulch that's in your garden, especially if it's kind of like loose matter, like leaves and that kind of stuff. 
Um, also, some of these uh, elements that you include in your garden to add visual interest, like the rocks and the logs, uh, can provide great overwinter sites too. Um, if you have a log that has some loose bark, beneath that bark is a great uh, spot for some butterfly eggs to hang out for the winter. So if you are going to start a butterfly garden, it's really important to just kind of spread the word and let people know um, that these wildlife friendly spaces are invaluable and you know just let people know why you're doing it. Um, if your neighbors are kind of intolerant of your milkweed, just explain it to them and um, you know you can cut the seed pods off as well if that becomes an issue for you. It can help prevent the spread, not 100%, but it definitely can help. And some of our gardening programs that I'd mentioned at uh, one point, these are some great uh, resources for you. If you are, maybe you're a seasoned gardener, maybe you just are getting started, we have a wonderful online uh, community called Over the Garden Fence. And uh, here you can share your stories and pictures. And if you have any questions, we also have a forum there. So you can go there and it's a great online source for people to kind of um, get together and talk about gardens. But I will say the program is in its infancy, so there's a lot of things still being developed. Um, but if you do go on there and log on and use it, uh, send us an email and, and give us some feedback because we always appreciate that kind of thing. Um, and if you do undertake a butterfly garden or any kind of wildlife friendly garden, we also recognize you by certification. So you, again, you can go online and apply for official um, certification with CWF. and. Um, We'll send you a plaque in the mail if that's what you want. And it's kind of a neat way to open the conversation up between neighbors. Our website, wildaboutgardening.org, is full of really fantastic resources. Um, we have that Native Plant Encyclopedia, which is a really great uh, resource for you. If you'd like to log on there, you can learn about all the different types of native plants in your area. And there's some great search um, functionality there with the search. So you can select your province, you can select um, if you have a sunny spot or a shady spot that you'd like to grow in, and we'll come up with a whole bunch of uh, suggestions for you. We also recently put in um, an illustrated glossary, so it's a really kind of cool way to learn about plants and the different plant parts. Um, we have a native plant supplier list too, so if you're kind of clueless as to where to get all these native plants that everyone keeps talking about, um, we do have a list uh, based on province, and it can give you a starting point. Of course, just Googling it can... Um, get you a lot of results too. And we also uh, put out a quarterly newsletter if you're not aware. Um, it's called uh, Grow Wild and it can give you all kinds of great seasonal tips on wildlife friendly gardening. So somebody's asking about um, Okay, so does CWF promote growing milkweed um, where local governments consider it not a nauseous weed? Um, no, we don't promote you growing them in those areas. We do uh, encourage you to check with your local Ministry of Agriculture um, just to check if it is a noxious weed in your area or not. Um, but I think typically with a noxious weed list, uh, we're talking about um, croplands. So if you're not, if you're in an urban area and there are no, um, you know, there's no farmland around you, you're probably okay. But it's definitely best to check with the Ministry of Agriculture of your province. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them in, or I'll leave my email here so that you can contact me. But it's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'll just wait a couple minutes and see if there are any questions here. Oh, and I think a few people, when they, they signed up, had the option of asking a few questions. So I can address a couple of those now while I wait for a couple more uh, questions. Someone was asking about the Luna Moth and uh, what could you plant to attract a Luna Moth? Well, uh, we suggest walnut and hickory trees are really fantastic for Luna Moths. For other um, night moths, you might want to try planting some plants that bloom at night. So there are, are a few uh, things there you can do. I think there's evening primrose is a good option. It has like a really, I think there's a pink variety, but we have a nice yellow plant here at the CWF Gardens. Um, blue flax is another good one. Um, I think there's a four o'clock plant that ble uh, that blooms at night, so that's another option too. Oh, thank you. 
people are having. Are there several varieties of milkweed? If so, is one recommended? So that's a question somebody's asking. Yes, there are many different types of uh, milkweed. There are, I think, 14 species across Canada. So what I would recommend to you is find out which ones are native to your province specifically, and um, then find, find out uh, what are the conditions of your yard or your garden, and then match that up. So the most common one and the most helpful to um, monarch butterflies uh, is the common milkweed, but unfortunately that one is on the nauseous weed list in uh, many provinces. Currently in Ontario, though, there has been a proposal to lift it from the noxious weed list. So hopefully that will happen and that will be fantastic. Um, swamp milkweed is a great one if you have kind of a moist area in your yard. But there are 14 different varieties and I can't remember them off the top of my head right now, but definitely look into that for sure. Oh, and when someone signed up, they were asking about um, butterfly gardening in shady areas and is that a possibility? Uh, yes, of course it's a possibility, but I think as we all know, uh, shady areas don't really support super big beautiful blooms that we all tend to love. You tend to have to deal with more foliage when we're talking about um, gardening in shady areas. Uh, but definitely there are some plants that you can grow in partial shade or so even in full shade. So things like um, goat's beard, uh, black cohosh are super great. Uh, choices. Even echinacea or purple coneflower uh, will grow in shady areas, different types of coneflowers too. They may not grow as well as they do in sunny areas, but certainly they'll grow in the shade. Also another option is to have a woodland garden. Um, so woodland gardens tend to have a lot of spring blooming plants. So um, things like trilliums and hepaticas, um, all the little things that are coming up right now. Um, but these ones can support some of the early butterflies that come out with the morning cloak. So those are great ones. And a lot of people wanted to know about milkweed and um, how to contain it and how to, you know, how to keep it under control or in a corner of their garden. Um, I will say milkweed tends to volunteer itself where it will. And uh, here at the CWF Gardens, we kind of just leave it be as much as possible. Um, but to help reduce the spread, you can clip the seed pods before they kind of turn brown, and uh, that can help reduce the spread. Some people have also planted them in um, containers, um, and that can help to reduce the spread as well because they reproduce by a couple of means. Uh, they can put up roots underground and then send shoots up, and um, as well as by seed, of course. So if there aren't any other questions, I uh, will just say thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, feel free to contact me and feel free to visit wildaboutgardening.org. Thanks so much.